Let's say you're on an interplanetary mission to Mars, millions of miles from the nearest hospital, and something in your body goes awry. Houston, we have a problem. Say a routine body scan reveals a potentially life-threatening blood clot. What on Earth, or in space I guess, do you do? If that happens here on Earth, we rush someone to the hospital and we can intervene. Um, if that happens on the International Space Station, our options are incredibly limited. A recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine describes an unprecedented medical event in which an astronaut on the International Space Station developed a blood clot just two months into a six-month mission. So how did NASA handle this unforeseen situation? To find out, we spoke to one of the co-authors on the article, Dr. James Paterini. He's a NASA flight surgeon who's in charge of astronauts' health before, during, and after spaceflight. In this case, the patient's over 250 you know, nautical miles overhead, they're traveling 17,500 miles an hour um, in orbit around Earth. And there's no sure thing in spaceflight. Spaceflight's hard. And so even the perfect plan, if it relies on things that have a chance of failure, um, may not be something you can execute. Dr. Paterini walked me through exactly what happened during this uncertain time on the space station. NASA is keeping the identity of the astronaut secret for privacy reasons, so none of the footage you see will depict any of the actual events. Walk us through, first of all, how the blood clot was discovered. It seemed like it was kind of by accident, really. This particular astronaut was participating in a study called Fluid Shifts. Um, what comes as a part of that study is a number of in-flight ultrasounds. And upon analyzing them here on the ground, um, the team noted that there didn't appear to be any flow, any blood flow in one of the large veins in the neck, the internal jugular vein. So when this was found, we were, of course, you know, very concerned, not only because this was the first time we had seen this in space, but because when these things are found on the ground, um, they can be, you know, potentially life-threatening. So this came as a surprise both to the astronaut and to you folks on the ground, um, because the astronaut wasn't really showing symptoms um, that might indicate a blood clot. There's no predisposing risk factors uh, for this individual whatsoever. We do risk stratification on individuals for whether they're at increased risk of forming clots or not. Uh, this individual was not. Terrestrially, we're most concerned about clots forming generally in the legs, with the concern being that pieces of them could break off and cause what we call a pulmonary embolism. They could go to the lungs, uh, which would be you know, very dangerous and, and could threaten your life. In space, things work very differently, and one of the concerns is we don't know what the natural history of this would be in microgravity. When we found it, we felt it had not been there for very long. You can tell this by how it looks on the ultrasound. When a clot is relatively new, it appears soft and what we call friable, so it's more likely to uh, look like it could break pieces off and go places. I mentioned the risk of pulmonary embolism. There's, of course, the other risk that we were concerned of is that it would extend upwards uh, towards the brain. These are things we're very concerned about. And we really were faced with two options. It was either an early return of the astronaut, and so cutting the mission short, or remain in place uh, on station and treat and try to organize and stabilize this blood clot so that when the time did come to come home, uh, that it would not pose as much of a risk. Why not just say, okay, we're gonna bring you home immediately and treat you on Earth? Coming back to Earth is a very uh, violent activity. There's the G-forces of re-entry, um, the dynamics of being shaken around like you're inside of a washing machine, of the chute coming out on any capsule, uh, followed by the car crash of the landing. These are all considerations that with a soft, fresh clod, um, we were very concerned that the decision to simply come home um, would take a patient who's asymptomatic and doing fine and place them at risk of dislodging a piece of this and going to the lung um, or elsewhere. So once the decision to treat was made by the clinical care team, things tend to move very quickly. Fortunately, we actually had a supply of uh, one type of anticoagulant, an oxaparin that's an injectable. We knew that we only had on the order of around 40 days a maximum of this uh, injectable supply. And so that was not gonna get us certainly to the end of the mission. We were starting to manifest a resupply vehicle with an oral medication uh, called a Pixaban that takes up much less mass in space. Destined for the International Space Station. Even with a perfect resupply, uh, something could go wrong. We lose resupply vehicles all the time. And so having your backup plan and your backup plan to your backup plan Certainly when the health of a crew member is relying on it, weighs very heavily on, on the patient care team. Yeah, so you have your diagnosis, um, but you are somewhat removed from the patient um, in this, this unprecedented situation. How do you go about treating somebody who's on the space station while you're still on Earth? Um, in this case, uh, the astronaut is both 
um, tasked with being the patient and also tasked with being the hands of the treatment team. We take gravity for granted in a lot of ways, and one of the ways is anytime you've looked at a bottle with some fluid in it. Um, here, you see a nice meniscus, all the fluid goes to the bottom, but really surface tension predominates in microgravity. And so what you'll see is the fluid kind of filling the interior, but leaving a cavity in the center. Um, if you want to get the fluid out, there's different techniques that astronauts have developed. Uh, you can do centrifugation, where you literally, you'll see astronauts spin to try to use centrifugal force to get the fluid to collect in one part of the vial. You can also kind of try to go around the inside of the vial with the, with the bevel of your needle and try to suck it up as you go. Um, but it's certainly a lot more complicated. I'm also curious how you go about choosing drugs to send to the International Space Station. We've got nine medical kits on the space station. They have a different kind of spectrum of medications and medical supplies uh, in each. Going all the way back to Apollo, they didn't know what they needed, and so what they relied on was crew feedback. You can go back to the Apollo mission reports, and what you see is that after every single mission, the contents of the medical kit changed. And so if we, everyone agrees, for example, that you need, say, something for nausea, well, there's, there's a pretty broad spectrum of medications that can be used for that, um, but if it's something injectable, then you think of all the mass and volume that comes along with the needles and the syringes and the fact that they can't be reused and how do you sterilize things if you do need to reuse them. And all these things go into consideration of, well, maybe we'll have an injectable, but how much of that are you gonna fly versus how much of the oral medication, which can be backed very, very tightly. The astronaut continued to take the blood thinner throughout the mission. NASA says that the astronauts' normal duties were not affected by the additional medical care. But the strangest and maybe most consequential part of the event happened after the astronaut came home. The last time we assessed it was the day prior to return, um, and we saw that there was still absent flow in microgravity. Um, we assessed it immediately upon uh, bringing the astronaut back to Earth and saw that completely normal flow had been restored. By 10 days after uh, return, there was no evidence of the clot. You could not find any residual uh, whatsoever, which really nails home that it's the microgravity environment uh, that we think is playing a significant role here. Upon further investigation in the study that originally found the blood clot, a new discovery emerged. A former astronaut who had participated in the study also showed signs of a possible blood clot. Now, there's 11 individuals as part of the study. Two out of 11, if, if real, is, is certainly concerning to us. And there's flow abnormality seen in, in more than that. If this is truly you know, occurring in around 20% of our astronauts, it raises a number of questions. Number one, has this really been happening for 50 years and we're just finding it now? It's absolutely possible. Um, are there other risk factors that predispose some people to developing these clots and, and we just don't really understand the interaction between microgravity and those risk factors? That's absolutely possible as well. I think the the biggest question though is if this has been occurring and this is something that we're just gonna routinely see in human spaceflight, what does that mean for doing these longer exploration class missions? It's one thing when, as I said, if something goes wrong, um, we can get people home in a number of hours uh, from the International Space Station. It's just not on the cards. You're days away for anywhere, even the moon, and you know certainly much longer if we go to Mars or anywhere else. And this isn't the only medical issue that might complicate prolonged spaceflight. There's something called spaceflight-associated neuroocular syndrome. We call it SANS for short. Um, this is also a relatively recent finding. This is within the last decade. It's a remodeling of the back of the eye and of the optic nerve sheath itself. How do we prevent it? How do we treat it? These are things we're still learning about. And that's still relatively new. That's within the last decade. And now we see that uh, there's changes in blood flow. I think the question of how bad is microgravity? We're learning it does more and worse things to the human body. At first it was, uh, you know, loss of bone density. Okay, we've got that under control. Okay, now it's loss of muscle mass. Well, we've got under that, that under control as well. Now it's this remodeling of the eye and the optic nerve. We're getting smart on that and we'll solve that eventually, I'm sure. Um, and now there's, you know, a propensity to form clots perhaps and these flow abnormalities in the venous system. And now every U.S. astronaut who flies periodically in flight, we are looking at these vessels um, and other large vessels with ultrasound um, to understand those flow patterns better and to find if there's any other um, clots that develop in any other crew members. We evolved to need 1G of gravity and I think we need 1G of gravity. And so the, uh, the question of um, is 1,6G on the moon enough? If we're going to live there for prolonged periods of time, is that enough to make these things go away? That's an open one. Um, I would say probably not. Um, I think it'll address an, a, a part
part of this spectrum, but not the full thing. I think 2001 was the big rotating space stations. And is, is there a solution, an engineering solution, to provide some level of gravity to our astronauts to mitigate uh, these types of, of physiological effects? And I think eventually we're going to need something like that. As we venture farther and stay longer in space, it's likely we'll discover even more limits to our biology. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. This incident is a reminder that NASA must be ready for anything. Because we aren't about to let the robots have all the fun in space. <laughs>